morning uh, to all uh, for this uh, first uh, session uh, on applying behavioral insights in the private sector organizations and business models. My name is uh, Ruth Maurik. I'm the moderator for this, uh, this panel, and uh, I will lead you uh, through the uh, presentations we have today. Uh, just to tell you a little bit about uh, my background, uh, I have a background in social sciences, as probably most of you, uh, in anthropology, sociology, and science technology studies. Uh, I worked in uh, um, different organizations throughout the years, but for the past 12 years, I am the CEO of a small uh, social enterprise focused on uh, doing res research uh, in a variety of uh, transition uh, uh, issues. Amongst others, uh, of course, also uh, behavioral insights in uh, business models, organizations, etc. Uh, welcome to all. Um, let me present to you um, the, the presenters uh, today. Uh, we will start with uh, Susanna Brunsting's presentation on empowering intermediaries. Uh, to train agro-food companies. Uh, then Michele Preziozzi uh, will present on industries and energy efficiency awareness campaigns. Jenny Palm will present on barriers and enablers for property owners um, uh, uh, of premises as organizations. Claudia Tauro will provide an analysis of energy savings and behavioral trends. And then finally, I will present on the behavior of certain transition entrepreneurs uh, out there. Um, may I ask you to all keep muted unless you are the speaker uh, and also do not turn on your camera on your, unless you are at that moment speaking. And for all of those uh, participating uh, as our audience today, please put your questions in the Q&A and I will uh, moderate uh, them. And once we have the Q&A, um, uh, you can, of course, uh, ask your question uh, live. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stop screen sharing. Susanna, are you, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Great. Um, then... Um, uh, I would like to ask you uh, to take the screen and start presenting. Um, Do you also want me to turn on my video? Uh, I think that would be nice, yes, so that people can... Uh, hello. Hello, <laughs> nice to everybody. see you again. Uh, <laughs> Very good to see you again. All right. The floor is yours. Well, thanks again. <clears throat> Do you keep the time, Ruth? Never mind. Yes, okay. I will. Sorry. I was All right. Yes. Well, welcome again. Today I am going to tell something about um, a European project um, we did uh, for two and a half years. We worked on the European project INDUCE, Horizon 2020 Coordination and Support Action, um, which was about empowering intermediaries to train agro-food companies in tackling organizational, cultural, and behavioral barriers for implementing energy efficiency measures. Um, for this 10 minutes, I'm going to focus on the heart of the project, uh, which was conducting in 15 pilots in 15 companies in four different countries, the Netherlands, Germany, Spain, and France. Um, um, and um, I'll dive straight into the uh, gap we addressed and the questions. Um, when we look at the literature on drivers and barriers, you notice that actually little insight is given to the nature and impact of organizational, cultural and behavioral barriers to the adoption of energy efficiency measures. And we looked mainly at process efficiency measures in this project. Um, and also um, how intermediar intermediaries who advise and train these companies uh, in this context, energy advisors, auditors, but also energy managers. When you're talking about bigger companies, they've dedicated energy managers, how they actually uh, pay attention to these barriers and, and, and tackle these barriers uh, to the extent we have seen them uh, operate um, in companies um, 
it appears that they also focus strongly on technical and economic uh, barriers for adoption. And um, they don't pay attention to these so-called softer barriers either. And what they find particularly dif difficult is to address the strategic advantages of such investments. So the aim of this project was to shed more light on, on the nature of these barriers of an organizational cultural and behavioral nature um, and to see how these intermediaries can um, be empowered to pay more attention to these barriers in the interventions they do in the companies. So for example, if they do a training in a company, how can they also pay attention to, um, uh, for example, barriers in the organizational structure that, that, that um, impede uh, the adoption of energy efficiency measures. So um, what was actually the, the, the big challenge in this project is to um, have these energy advisors adopt new ways of, uh, of training um, the people in the companies. And to ensure that we achieve that goal, we had energy advisors and also agro-food branch organizations as project partners in every pilot country. Um, you may have wondered how we defined, conceptualized and operationalized organizational, cultural and behavioral. I will not go deep into that because I don't have the time, but I made this slide to give you an idea of the, of the theories that, um, that inspired us. Uh, so for organizational barriers, that's amongst others the uh, eight-step change model by John Cotter a change management uh, theory. Uh, for the culture uh, scan in the companies, we used the theory of basic values by Swartz. And uh, to, um, to investigate behavioral change um, and all its aspects, um, the behavior change wheel. The method we used uh, to work uh, with the pilot companies was the human-centered design approach, uh, which is by IDEO.org. We did not make that up ourselves. Um, and what's, um, what's typical for the human-centered design approach is that the people for whom you develop an intervention are involved in creating the intervention right from the start. So um, what then happens is uh, as you start taking stock of the situation in companies, you start collecting data, uh, you get many ideas for possible trainings that would be useful for that, that company. So you get divergence uh, uh, up to a point where uh, you get a bit impatient uh, because you have so many ideas, but what are we going to do? Uh, there was particular impatience on the side of the companies because they are used to 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 move swiftly. Uh, once they have decided that um, they want to uh, to be part of the project, they expect something uh, well the training to take place very soon and evaluate it and then done. But uh, of course, this European project didn't work like that. Um, before we started the co-creation sessions with the people in the company, uh, one year had passed. Uh, so that's already a challenge uh, when working with actual companies and doing actual trainings uh, uh, to, to, to match their, their expectations and their pacing with that of, uh, of a European project. Um, I'll briefly uh, describe the steps that we take, uh, that we took uh, once we had confirmed their participation. We first uh, did an energy assessment uh, with the company's energy manager to see where they uh, stood at that time. Um, with their energy management and also which measures they already had implemented. And we also did uh, identical energy assessment with the same person at the very end of the trajectory so we could see the differences. We interviewed uh, key uh, roles in the organization involved in decision making on energy efficiency measures, uh, mostly from the middle management and also a couple from the higher management. And for the employees, we did a culture survey. Uh, we then presented, um, based on all that data, our uh, suggestions to the companies for trainings that could be useful for them at higher management, middle management and production level. 
And then um, we discussed with them what is, is at this particular time uh, feasible for you, what's most valuable to you. And then we designed a tailored training program for each of the companies training took place it was evaluated uh, with the participants at two points in time and then concluded as already said by this energy assessment to be able to calculate impact from these 15 pilots. I will give you two examples of the types of interventions that we did. Um, this was an uh, example from an intervention at the production level, so the people who actually operate the production lines uh, in the factory. Um, and this exercise uh, had the aim to have more exchange between the middle management and the higher management and, and the production level, to exchange ideas about um, energy efficiency in the company. And uh, for that purpose, it worked very well. What we did is we brought them all together in a room. Um, the management explained the sustainability policy of the company. Um, then the energy advisors uh, gave some uh, more technical uh, information um, about the energy consumption processes of, uh, of the company and uh, why uh, it is important uh, for the company to, uh, to take energy efficiency measures. And then there was an interactive part where um, the, the group was split in two and um, first uh, they took a quiz to test knowledge of energy efficiency, uh, also to keep um, keep the training nice and, and interactive and the informative parts not too long. Um, and the other half of the group then at the same time uh, went on an energy hunt through the factory to detect uh, possible improvements, uh, easy low hanging fruit energy efficiency improvements by taking a walk through the factory and identifying uh, energy consuming processes that, uh, that could be uh, improved. And they came back with a very impressive list of ideas. The management was very pleased with this exercise because there were a lot of ideas on that list that they could actually uh, implement uh, on, um, well, quite easily and uh, on a quite uh, short term. Another example of intervention we did at management level um, uh, was the implementation of a tool that has the aim to um, de-bias capital investment decisions, making sure that energy efficiency is a criterion um, that is discussed when discussing capital uh, investment decisions with the ultimate aim of uh, incorporating energy efficiency as a standard procurement criterion, which in this Donna? case... Yes? Sorry to intervene, but uh, your time is almost up. Yes, I am about to finish. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. Um, so in this case, um, indeed, the company also adopted uh, energy efficiency as a standard procurement criterion, which was a very good result. Um, I included this uh, for reference. If you see this presentation later here, this is the best table um, reflecting uh, the impact that we made with this project, that we estimated we made with this project. That's, of course, always, uh, um, well, you know, a bit difficult to ascribe impact to interventions, but we tried our best. Um, impact was above expectation. Um, and I will skip this because my time is up. These are some challenges we encountered. And um, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Susanna. Um, I see that uh, Jenny already uh, put a question in uh, the Q&A in the chat. Uh, thank you for that. Um, the, the plan, as with all the sessions at BEHAVE at this moment, is that we do the presentations one after uh, the other. Only time for a quick question on uh, to clarify something. And then at the end, we have a um, comprehensive uh, Q&A uh, discussion. Um, so please put your questions, as I said, in the chat, unless you have a a question for clarification. Susanna, thank you very much for this interesting uh, presentation. I have a lot, lot of questions for you for later. Uh, could you please stop sharing your screen? And then I would like to uh, ask uh, Michele Preziozzi, um, who works at uh, Enea, the Italian Energy um, Agency, 
um, uh, to uh, to take the floor and uh, and present. Thank you, Ruth. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Miguel Preziosi. Uh, I am a researcher at the Energy Efficiency Department at the Ateneal National Agency for New Technology, Energy, and Sustainable Economic Development. Uh, the department also acts as the National Energy Efficiency Agency. And uh, since 2015 has been engaged uh, in the uh, implementation of the information and training program targeted to both the uh, citizens and to the Italian industrial sector. Uh, sorry, I'm not sharing the screen. <laughs> not yet, no, but you were introducing yourself, so that's yeah. not a problem. <laughs> sorry. Also for you, uh, you have 10, uh, 10 minutes for the presentation. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, basically, in summary, the work uh, we present uh, today aims to understand uh, first whether this uh, information campaign has been effective in facilitating the implementation of uh, good energy efficiency practices among Italian industries. Another objective is to uh, illustrate the approach that Italy has followed to measure the energy saving achieved through this campaign. Uh, finally, uh, the goal is to uh, evaluate if and how much this campaign has been effective and have contributed to the achievement of the Italian energy saving targets. Uh, the need for the implementation information training um, campaign arises from the European legislation. Uh, in fact, according to the Energy Efficiency uh, Directive, member states are required to disseminate information um, to citizens and uh, companies on energy efficiency. Uh, the directive also uh, refers uh, to the need to create a, fra a framework to provide technical assistance and targeted information to small and medium enterprises. Uh, Italy has uh, implemented this European requirement through a national decree, uh, which according to the Article 13 NEA, which is the National Energy Efficiency Agency, uh, shall set up an information training uh, program with the general goal uh, to uh, facilitate the efficient use of energy for both households and uh, industries. Uh, considering this uh, latter uh, target group, uh, the companies, uh, the general goal is to raise awareness uh, um, the, and encourage enterprises to carry out energy audit. Uh, uh, with the final objective to stimulate uh, the uh, implementation of energy efficiency measures. So, um, the campaign targeted to, is, in, uh, to the Italian industries uh, is made up of basically four main lines of action. So the first one is the establishment of permanent technical tables with the main industrial associations, the organization of seminars and conferences, uh, Collaboration of standardized reporting models for operators and, uh, and um, energy audit data processing, and the publication of sectoral guidelines for energy audit uh, and energy efficiency interventions. So, um, moving up to the uh, core of the presentation, uh, this uh, figure here summarizes uh, the process that we followed to quantify the, the energy saving uh, deriving from the information training campaign. Uh, the first uh, step uh, was to identify the energy saving achieved by the Italian industries. Uh, it was done using the energy saving uh, reported uh, to the National Energy Efficiency Agency by the company subject to mandatory energy audit uh, requirement. Next, uh, once quantified the energy saving achieved by these uh, companies, we built a questionnaire targeted to this specific group of companies from which we extracted the percentage of energy savings that are directly linked to the information training campaign. Um, according to the Article 7 of the National Legislative Decree uh, transposing the Energy Efficiency Directive, uh, the company sub companies subject to mandatory energy audit requirement and companies certified according to the international standard 
ISO 15001 are required to notify to the public authority energy savings additional to those already achieved through the Watt Certificate Scheme, that basically is the um, and the an energy efficiency obligation scheme uh, in Italy. Uh, on the basis of this reporting, we uh, identified the energy saving on which to uh, assess uh, the effectiveness of the uh, information and training program. The table here um, shows the energy saving uh, notified to the public authorities by the industries between 2015 and 2019. And this uh, additional savings amount to roughly uh, four uh, kilotons of oil equivalent. Uh, the next step has been to build a questionnaire, as explained before, targeted to those companies subject to mandatory energy audit uh, uh, requirement. Um, this questionnaire was administered, ad administered uh, between February and March 2019, and respondents were 300. Uh, with a response rate over 50%. Uh, the questionnaire was uh, uh, structured with uh, multiple choice questions with scale ranging from one, representing not important, to four, representing very important. Uh, the slide here uh, goes into further details on the approach we followed to analyze the questionnaire uh, result. Uh, basically, uh, we uh, selected the percentage of companies uh, that simultaneously meet uh, uh, three uh, criteria. First, we selected companies that declared that did not obtain savings from measures implemented to comply with legislations and uh, from uh, uh, measures implemented to state incentives. The second criteria groups companies that consider the increased awareness on energy efficiency as uh, having a significant role in the decision to implement energy saving measures. Uh, finally, uh, the third criteria um, identifies companies that consider the information training program carried out by ENEA, uh, which is the uh, National Energy Efficiency Agency, as very important in the decision to um, carry out investment in energy efficiency. Um, Eventually, this uh, percentage of companies was multiplied by the energy saving notified by the public authority, as explained before, and for a correction factor of 0 0.2, uh, considering that there are other factors uh, different from the formation training program that simultaneously uh, give a contribution to the decision of companies to, imp to implement uh, energy saving measures. So, um, the slide here are presenting the main result. Uh, considering the uh, first criteria, 63% um, of companies meet this criteria. Um, coming to the second criteria, uh, almost 94% meet this criteria. And eventually, 12% uh, of companies uh, considering the information and training program as very important in the decision to carry out uh, the energy efficiency interventions. Um, the figure on the right uh, um, lists uh, some um, factors that, um, and we ask basically to the companies to give us uh, their opinion on the importance of this factor and their decision to implement energy efficiency measures. So, as we can see, the activities carried out by the information and training program um, have not been among the most significant drivers for the implementation of energy saving measures, even though uh, we can see uh, in, the, in the fourth line, the round tables on energy audits uh, has been appreciated in many cases by the uh, companies. As we expected, uh, the major driver for um, the implementation of energy uh, saving measures uh, uh, were the energy obligation, uh, the obligation of energy audit uh, and the advice from the internal energy manager and external consultants. Um, the percentage uh, extracted from the questionnaire was then multiplied by the uh, energy savings notified by the companies for the correction uh, for the correction factor, as explained before. And the table shows the energy saving uh, that we identified as directly linked to the information training campaign between 2015 and 2019. Uh, the cumulative savings uh, amount to almost 200 kilotons of oil equivalent that represent uh, 
uh, 5% of the energy savings notified by the companies under the obligation of energy audit. Uh, this final slide uh, on the left uh, shows the total savings uh, arising from the information campaign targeted both to the industrial sector, as explained in the previous slides, uh, and also from the campaign targeted to Italian citizens. Um, the amount of uh, savings uh, um, that um, directly linked to the campaign uh, amount to uh, 307 kilotons of oil equivalent. Uh, eventually, this uh, figure on the right shows all the policy measures uh, that uh, has been notified by Italy to the European institutions. As we can see, the mandatory scheme, the wet certificate scheme, uh, uh, targeted to industries and uh, the uh, um, tax relief targeted to, to households are by far the most uh, uh, significant measures in terms of energy savings, uh, followed by the uh, other alternative policy measures notified, uh, among which we find also the uh, information and training program with uh, this uh, 300 kilotons of oil uh, equivalent. And uh, that's all from my side. Thanks. Thank you very much, Michele. Very interesting presentation. Uh, I see the questions uh, starting to uh, flow in. Is there any question for clarification that anyone would like to ask at this point? Otherwise, I would like to ask Michele to stop sharing uh, yeah, the sure. screen. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, no one for clarification? Okay, good. Um, then I would like to present uh, to you uh, Jenny Palm, uh, who is a professor in sustainable urban governance at uh, Lund University. Um, Jenny, can you start sharing your video and your screen so we can see you? Yes, I hope I have done that. There you are. Yeah, yes. Perfect. Hello. Good yeah, morning. Yeah. Nice to see you. <laughs> morning. All right. Well, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I will uh, tell you about a project that I have to the, together with my colleague, Katarina Reindel, uh, and that has been financed by the Swedish Energy Agency and, and now also is related to an ongoing uh, Horizon project that we have. Uh, and when we started out this and uh, discussing what to present for uh, for this uh, BEHAVE conference, we, we were planning to present uh, an article on barriers and enablers. Uh, and we will do that, but uh, we have already published the one that we were discussing to present. So, so we, I will present for you the discussion that we have, an ongoing discussion that we have for a second analysis of the same material, uh, because we would like to take the opportunity to have your input on, on this and how to go on. So we have a project where, where the aim is uh, to, to identify barriers and enablers for uh, photovoltaic adoption. And the focus is on uh, property owners on non-residential buildings because that has simply been less research. There have been a lot of focus on homeowners so far, but less on this uh, segment. And, and they have, we think they are interesting because they uh, there are a lot of buildings that they own and they uh, can make a difference in, in the transition. Uh, so um, uh, we did a literature review on that uh, and um, also interviewed uh, actors on that. And we have written uh, an, an article on that that I will come back to. But what we have done is uh, that we, except for looking into early research, we also uh, interviewed 25 uh, property owners in Sweden and we also did a survey, a questionnaire, but we had a very low response rate. So we turned this into a qualitative study. So we treated this questionnaire, the responses as a, a qualitative response uh, instead. And then we also have done uh, interviews with DSOs and uh, trading companies to discuss how their perception on photovoltaics uh, are and, and the possibility to increase that in Sweden because the levels today are very low. 
So in the first article, we ended up with this, uh, that we find, of course, a lot of barriers that we, from earlier uh, research, but also from, from the interviews and, and the survey questions and a lot of neighbors. Uh, and there were um, some surprising, but otherwise uh, the usual suspect, like the economic barriers uh, and also environmental opportunities and so on. Uh, so uh, that uh, we thought was interesting, of course. But then we started because in this project, in both projects, uh, we have an idea uh, as often that we want to give some policy recommendation. Uh, and then we started to discuss that, of course, we could have as a policy recommendation that we should target the economic barrier here, for example. But as we know, uh, the, that all these companies are quite different and, and how they perceive barriers and enablers are very different and also what uh, a barrier means in a company uh, are, are quite different. So we think that this first mapping gives a very, very good overview, but, but it also contributes to, redu to the, that it becomes a uh, focus on an isolated factors uh, that don't really give us the complexity of, of the situation. So in this, we are missing the context uh, in where an investment decision is embedded. And then we were thinking that we should try to, to yeah, reflect upon this in our uh, second uh, paper. And, and for example, one of the retailers told us that, that his experience was that, um, that when those these, these segments are making a decision if they are going to install photovoltaics or not, it is based on their opinion rather than on facts. They don't do a really good um, background search before, but they think something and, and act on it. Uh, and, and there are an organization culture that where ex, uh, established truth uh, exists that you need to challenge, perhaps, if you want uh, to increase the number of PV installation. But he also said that, that when, when an organization had installed one photovoltaic plant, it was much easier for them to come to, to the next decision and, and, and implement even more. And that we thought was, uh, was interesting because this is that, yeah, you need to understand the, the situation in, in, in where this um, decision is made. Uh, so then we went back and look at our uh, quotations. And, and so, and if looking, for example, if we just single out this economy as a barrier, for example, then we can see that there are quite different embeddings. So this is one company saying that the payoff time simply stops us. Uh, otherwise we would already have done this. Uh, and this is another company. I think the economic factors are the big barriers. So only with reduced prices and if the state can offer subsidies, I think uh, that's the way forward. And this is a third, PV has not really been profitable, but it's part of our sustainability commitment. That is what makes P uh, photovoltaics of interest of us. So yeah, okay, it was not profitable, but not that uh, big challenge for this company. And this is another so that says that the payoff time will be nine years and that is what we want to achieve. And so they were happy with the payoff time because they had other expectation. And this uh, last one, so you, you want the money, money back in the long run, but that uh, is uh, not the most important to us. For us, the environmental, it's more important that we can produce our own energy and not need to buy it from the grid. So this is really different perception on the same issue that I think it is important to, to also reflect upon because the policy suggestion for those different um, uh, companies will, will differ actually uh, what they will act upon. And also, uh, if you, you can also take the material and go more in depth into one organization or one uh, company that we interview. So this is, now we are coming into the middle of, of this interview and the interviewer are saying, so you mean that the environment is an important profile issue for you? And this property owner says, yes, it's definitely. If we take our electricity, we just have green electricity. Our ambition is to reach 100 uh, percent fossil free heating and we have reached 99.7 so we are there we invest in electrical vehicles we discuss renewable a lot that we should go for renewable en energy if if that is photovoltaics or wind uh, power doesn't matter 
Uh, so you have both wind and solar powers. No, no, wind power and just two, so three photovoltaic plants. Uh, we also have a couple of solar panels, uh, that is solar heating. Uh, we also have an energy saving initiative where we have uh, set aside money for water saving measures and energy saving measures in the existing stock. And we have worked very hard with that. We are environmental certified so we can keep track of our chemicals and we clean up in, in uh, for example, PCBs. So in this case, we have a company where the photovoltaics is really part of a, of a vision. They want to turn this uh, company into a green company. So then it also influence what we could really recommend, the kind of, um, of uh, policy we should recommend uh, for this company. So then we have started, and, and this is what we want your input on. Uh, so we have um, discussed if we should uh, use these idle types, for example, to contextualize a decision, because we have a lot of material and we need to, to yeah, narrow it down and make it possible to say something about. And then we were thinking that, yes, perhaps we could have this tape payoff focused company that sees uh, photovoltaics as, as a way to cut cost, costs but uh, and, and uh, buying less electricity from the grid and sell their production back to the grid. And then in this company, they have a strong pay, uh, focus on payoff time. And, and for this company, for example, uh, the policy recommendation should uh, concern subsidies. But if you have an environmental in interested company, money is not the main issue. Uh, and they simply seek uh, new options for photovoltaic installations. So they have a kind of a other driving force for this. Uh, and and they are um, they are quite satisfied with, with the investment they have made and, and they are convinced that this is profitable and sustainable in the long run. And the recommendation for this company or, or uh, for example, subsidies would not uh, affect this company that much. And then we have the ignore and, and they have no special focus on environment or energy issues and they lack someone that is responsible. And no one is really demanding the photovoltaics. So, so in this case, information would be a much better policy mean, I would say. So what, the, so what I hope we can discuss, and I think this relates actually to the other uh, presentations as, as well, so I think that could be nice. Uh, but what, So what we are thinking about now is uh, if these idle types, if it is interesting, uh, and it could be, but the interviews are not so clear cut that I just showed you, it was a simplification. So some aspects are mentioned by all companies, so it's not really that obvious how to divide into these clear typologies that I just showed you. It was, uh, yeah, we overemphasized that a little bit bit. And also the answer depends on the company size. It's of course much easier to accept a financial loss if, if you are a big company uh, and established and not a new company that perhaps risk bankruptcy. So, so it's also perhaps it's more related to other factors than what they are saying here. Uh, and we also have one interview from each company. So, so then we're thinking, is this really the view of the individual or is it the view of the company? And we're also thinking that in some cases, we think we, we speak with this environmental champion in the company. Uh, so perhaps it's not that representative in the end. Um, so that was what we wanted to discuss in the end of this uh, session and we will be very happy to hear all your reflections and input on this. So, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Very, uh, very interesting indeed. And as you said, it's a beautiful build up also uh, with the other two uh, presentations uh, we already had. So looking forward to the discussion at the end. And I see already some uh, uh, reflections uh, for you in uh, the Q&A. So to all the uh, presenters, you can, of course, already take a look at, at the questions so that you can uh, uh, prepare your, uh, your answers in the, in the bigger Q&A at the end of this presentation. Is there anybody who has a question for clarification for Jenny? Otherwise, I propose we move on and we move. If you want to ask a question, unmute. Just give you five seconds. 
it's weird eh, to to do all of this online. <laughs> yes, it is. I don't see anyone uh, but you, Jenny, at the moment. Yeah. Not sure if anyone is listening. I had a, I had a, a panel moderation uh, a few months ago in another conference, and then I could. Uh, don't worry, it doesn't work that way with Zoom. But I, there was another software platform, and I could actually see if people were actively looking at the screen of the presenter or if they were opening up other things on their computer. That was really scary. Um, nothing like that today. All right. I don't think there is any question for clarification. Uh, so thank you, Jenny. Please, uh, uh, as you already did, uh, stop sharing your camera. And I would like to invite uh, Claudia Tauro, uh, who is as Michele, Michele uh, I don't know how to pronoun pr pronounce Michele. it, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, from INEA, uh, but a different department, if I understand correctly. Uh, uh, no, the same department, but a different okay. uh, lab. Different lab. Um, and you are going to present about uh, energy savings from uh, mandatory energy audits. So quite interesting to hear about that. Yes, we can see your screen. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Yours. Uh, okay. Good morning, everybody. I'm Claudia Toro from Enea, as you said before, and as uh, Michele Preziosi. And I'm from the Energy Efficiency Unit Department. And today I'm going to uh, present this work related with uh, mandatory energy audits mechanism in Italy and with a focus on the effect of the um, energy management system certifications and also um, energy monitoring system. Um, before uh, going into the details of the work that we have done, uh, just let me very briefly uh, introduce the main framework of the uh, mandatory energy audit scheme in Italy. Uh, this scheme uh, constitutes the uh, part of the transposition of the um, European Energy Efficiency Directive, and uh, it imposes the uh, obligation of energy audits uh, every four years for uh, large enterprises, but also for uh, energy intensive companies. Uh, Enea uh, manages the program, uh, including the uh, data gathering and the uh, subsequent analysis on those data. Uh, so Enea uh, links the uh, policymaker, which in this case is the Ministry of the Economic Development, with the uh, enterprises, business associations, but also in general energy services uh, uh, stakeholders. Uh, for the year of obligation of 2019, which is the second uh, cycle of obligations because this mechanism started in 2015, uh, Enea received and collected more than uh, 11,000 energy audits coming from more than uh, 6,000 enterprises uh, from more than 600 sectors. Um, and these audits uh, cover more than 50 million tons uh, of energy consumption, which corresponds uh, roughly to one third of the gross inland energy consumption. Um, so the work that I'm presenting here uh, is just one of the subsequent studies that we have developed, that we are developing using this uh, huge database, which is the database of the energy audits, the uh, mandatory energy audits. Uh, aim of this work has been to analyze the energy savings and the behavioral trends from the application of these schemes in Italy. Um, Energy audit, the definition of energy audit is the, uh, it can be considered as a structured uh, analysis of the energy use uh, of an activity of a, a production site, uh, uh, but this could be also applied to tertiary sector, for example. And it constitutes the, a first step towards increasing energy efficiency within a firm and in the uh, development of energy saving strategies. Uh, the aim of an energy audit is to uh, have a reduction of specific energy consumption of the production site. And we can have two different approaches, an approach related to design 
So in the selection of best available technology, in the dimensioning of the system, and also an approach more related to operation and maintenance. And in this approach, we can include the installation of monitoring and control systems, and also uh, energy management systems. Um, an energy management system, in fact, helps uh, the uh, enterprise in building a structured process for monitoring its consumption, its energy consumption. And the aim of these uh, systems is to uh, improve the internal efficiency um, by energy performance improvement actions, so uh, energy efficiency interventions. Uh, the uh, adoption of those systems can lead to first off the reduction of energy consumption, but also several other co-benefits like the uh, improvement of industrial productivity and uh, an overall uh, improvement of the company competitiveness. So what we have done here, we have investigated the uh, ISO 50001 certified firms and also sites with an energy monitoring systems to try to understand if those systems has, uh, have an influence on corporate behavior related to energy efficiency. Uh, how can we measure the corporate behavior in this sense? We can measure this considering the uh, APIA, so the Energy Performance Improvement Actions, as indicators of this behavior. Uh, so we focus on uh, certified companies, so we selected the energy audits from certified companies and also sites with uh, energy monitoring systems. And we made also a focus on general APIAs, which are uh, those uh, interventions not strictly related to process or technical measures, but uh, related to capacitation and energy management, uh, implementation of energy management systems, uh, uh, improvement of um, management, monitoring, or other actions like this. Um, we collected, we selected four sectors because this is just a preliminary analysis. We want to then extend this analysis to other sectors. We started with these four, which are two from industry and two from tertiary. Uh, we have uh, ceramics and plastics, we selected these two because are energy intensive uh, um, sectors, uh, but are quite different because we have in plastics uh, several small and medium sized enterprises, uh, and mainly they have just one or two production sites. While in ceramics, we have more large enterprises, so it's a different word. Then we have the ter in for the tertiary sectors, retails and banks that, of course, are completely different economic sectors. So also the uh, sites are different, different uh, uh, technologies. And uh, for both of them, we have mainly large enterprises. And we wanted to uh, evaluate the impact of energy monitoring system and energy management system on the uh, company, uh, what we have called propensity to plan or implement energy efficiency measures. In this table, we have some numbers. So we collect, this is the number of energy audits, uh, the number of companies which presented these audits and the percentage of ISO uh, 50001 companies and the monitored sites. Uh, it is clear that the percentage of uh, ISO certified companies is quite low, but we can, uh, say that, okay, the, the percentage is low, but several of these companies have um, multi-sites. Multi so we have uh, more than this amount of uh, energy audits, while the percentage of monitored sites is quite high because uh, uh, monitoring is, uh, uh, was an obligation for this second uh, cycle of, not for all, but for the second cycle, uh, it was an obligation. Um, so we want we uh, define some indicators to 
quantify this propensity related to APAs and energy savings, like the average number of APAs implemented or planned, um, the average energy savings per APIAs, uh, but and also the percentage of general measure planned or implemented. And we also defined some economic indicators related to the cost effectiveness of these interventions and the payback time. And here we can see some uh, results. We have the, um, these two graphs represent the APAs per site and the implemented APAs per company. Uh, in this graph here on the left, uh, we can compare ISO and not ISO um, sites. And it is clear that for all of these four um, sectors, uh, the uh, numbers of APAs per site is higher for certified um, sites. Uh, and the same can be uh, noticed for uh, monitoring systems compared with non-monitoring system. Where Here, I mean sites where we have a monitoring system and sites without this. And we also include this analysis related to large enterprises and small and medium-sized enterprises to better understand these results. Uh, the picture is a bit um, different if we analyze this uh, implemented API per companies and it is clear as in retail we have a very large number of implemented APAs per companies because in this sector we have that um, the, there are few large enterprises with several uh, sites so it is clear that this big number is related to this but again certified versus not certified seems to be to have a better propensity to um, implement APIAs. Here we have also a, a little focus on general APAs and in this case uh, we can say that these interventions are primary uh, implemented in the tertiary sector, uh, while in the manufacturing sectors, they are less than 20% of the uh, implemented measures. And again, we can see that certified um, retail, for example, retail sites, uh, implemented uh, um, more general APAs than not certified. And the only difference is in the banks where we can see that uh, ISO 50001 certified seems to um, implement less general intervention than banks. This aspect should be um, studied with detail in the to better understand which kind of interventions they are um, implemented here. Oh, yeah. um, Yes. Sorry to interrupt you, but you are running out of time. And okay, I see okay. You still have quite Sorry. some slides. So. Okay, uh, just here uh, on savings, uh, because it is important also to uh, analyze the savings associated with those uh, APIAs. Um, and here the picture is quite clear. We have that ISO uh, certified seems to perform a better savings than not certified, and the same for the monitoring system. Let me just so go to this. Uh, aspect related to the investment. Uh, so what we have here that we also analyze the um, the average investment per site and the payback time and the um, the final conclusion here is that the uh, ISO company seems to be more aware of energy efficiency opportunity and seems to invest less but in a more effective way while monitoring system uh, sites uh, seems to shorten the return time of investments. And uh, this is especially clear in the retail uh, sector. Uh, so just to finish here, I'm sorry for the, uh, the time. Uh, we demonstrated by empirical data collected from energy audits that the adoption of ISO 50001 certification and the installation of the monitoring system in those four sectors appear to have a positive influence on the behavior of companies toward energy efficiency actions and seems to increase their awareness in the identification of energy efficiency opportunities. We are going to uh, extend this analysis to other sectors and to focus more specifically on some specific intervention. Thank you. I'm sorry for the delay. 
No problem. Uh, we, of course, have a little bit uh, uh, time to uh, uh, go over, uh, over time. Uh, could you please stop sharing your screen? Yeah. Is there any question for clarification for Claudia? If not, uh, I will start sharing my screen um, as the final uh, presenter. Please, could you, one of you tell me uh, if you actually um, see the screen? Yes, we can see the screen. Fantastic. That's good. Um, so uh, I'm the, uh, the, the one closing uh, this session with the presentation, uh, and I'm also doing it uh, from a slightly different uh, perspective. Uh, the four presentations before were about, uh, so to say, the recipients of the, um, the energy measures and the audits, etc. Uh, the work that um, my team and I have been uh, focusing on for the past few years uh, has been work that focused on actually the, the organizations, the entrepreneurs delivering uh, the measures uh, to uh, private households or uh, to organizations, property owners, etc. So in that sense, I think uh, this, uh, this whole panel provides a, a nice perspective from uh, different, uh, different angles. Um, the work has been conducted uh, from a sense of, uh, of urgency that was felt, uh, of course, that we all feel uh, to actually reduce energy consumption uh, and um, uh, change our system to more renewable energy sources, uh, including also, of course, a focus on uh, uh, energy efficiency and savings, etc. And we started to work several years ago um, in, uh, in, in the um, context of the uh, now called uh, Users um, uh, Technology Collaboration Program of the International uh, Energy Agency. And what we actually wanted to focus on uh, with this work was to find out what on the side of those delivering services, measures, uh, products, etc., could actually be seen or witnessed and learned about uh, how uh, they approach it, what that means in terms of actually uptake uh, of their uh, measure or service or product. And we had a hypothesis um, that uh, although uh, there is a very slow market uptake of a lot of the innovations and, and business models um, out there, uh, there is a reason other than only, of course, what, what we have been hearing now, uh, that there are a lot of barriers uh, and, and, um, and also drivers not, not maximized to actually get uh, the, uh, the market to take up uh, all of those innovations, um, products, services, uh, and the business models accompanying them. So we wanted to actually find out, are there business models and type of measures, services, uh, out there that are, to some extent, more successful uh, than others. And in the first few years of our research, we indeed, indeed witnessed um, that there are uh, differences. And we found that those business models uh, that were more service-oriented uh, than product-oriented were actually indeed uh, more successful in market share, uh, uptake, scaling um, of, uh, of their service and product. But that wasn't enough. And the enterprises or entrepreneurs uh, involved actually also uh, needed to have a certain set of capabilities or perform a certain behavior, uh, since we are at the BEHAVE conference, um, to actually be able to provide this service in, in the right manner to, uh, to the um, property owners, households, uh, or organizations. We, we identified a lot of, or um, investigated a lot of case studies, um, uh, more than um, uh, 75 in the course of all the years, ranging from retrofitting uh, light as a surface, heat, uh, heating districts, measures, uh, including also demand response and flexibility service. So a very wide range of uh, product service combinations and the business models accompanying them. 
So what we found, as I said before, is that those um, entrepreneurs and, and enterprises out there that are more service oriented in their business model were more successful. I'm not going to to, to stay long with this sheet because uh, I would like to focus on the, the more behavioral side of it, um, but uh, they are interlinked. Uh, what we have seen is that um, product-oriented business models, um, um, in short, they uh, deliver something up to the transaction phase. So you buy it uh, and then it's uh, shaking hands, finished, uh, that's it, thank you. Uh, a service-oriented business model, however, is completely different. Uh, it, it starts, so to say, um, at the moment of transaction, um, and it focuses on the use phase. So that, that means that the actual uh, value is created in the use, uh, and the um, uh, whole relationship with the user is also completely different. It's much more personal, direct, long-term, uh, and focused on keeping up uh, the, the service delivery, so to say. To be able to do so, what we found is that those uh, entrepreneurs actually uh, demonstrate a very different type of, um, uh, well, activities, behavior, practices um, in delivering this service. And uh, it can be um, categorized into four um, types of skills. Um, sensing, so those entrepreneurs really become a researcher like us, almost doing case studies, diving deep into the lives and the context of the users to really understand what they need, what their values, needs, uh, dreams, etc. are. And then they conceptualize it. So they turn it into, and very often in co-creation, into an actual uh, proposition uh, that is needed, that is wanted, uh, very often, as I said, co-created even with the users. Um, and they understand, and we've heard already a little bit about the multiple benefits of, of energy, they understand that delivering this measure, this energy measure, is actually a small part of what this end user actually needs or wants. Very often they have a lot of other benefits uh, that are very often primary benefits for them, uh, and the energy savings are secondary benefits, are the multiple benefits. Um, and to be able to deliver that, they need a lot of different stakeholders working together, uh, delivering this, uh, this service, and they or orchestrate this collaboration. And then finally, they are really good at uh, scaling and stretching, um, so expanding their business and scaling up, as I said before. However, um, we also found, um, uh, focusing the last few years on the more um, novel, radical type of services out there uh, that are very much service-oriented, demonstrate the right business model, have the right uh, servitization skills that I just discussed, uh, still facing uh, quite some challenges that have to do with the fact that they are operating in a system in transition. The energy system is not a, a stable system. It's, it's changing uh, as we are all working very hard to actually get it to change. But that also implies that there are characteristics for those developing business in that system. And those are the five uh, that uh, all the entrepreneurs that we talked with uh, highlighted. They said it's actually really complex. It's not difficult. Well, it's difficult as well, but it's complex. Because when we want to change uh, one element, for example, uh, with our end users, uh, we face actually almost a systemic change that needs to be in place to actually uh, be able to, to, to make the change at the, the homeowners or property owners' uh, premises. In addition, uh, a lot of those developing the more radical type of uh, services, what they face is um, orchestrated irresponsibility, so-called, which means that there is no leadership. Uh, there is um, no one really responsible for designing this transition, managing it. Um, and that also means that there are a lot of uncertain outcomes. For a lot of technologies, products, services out there, they don't know if they are going to be the ones uh, making it. Uh, there are no clear paths, uh, socio-technical paths out there yet. Uh, in addition, they face a lot of contestation, a lot of conflicts. Um, there's no consensus yet as to what counts as a fact, who is an expert, especially with the more radical uh, services out there. 
Um, and uh, they say this system feels like a technocratic block. It feels like uh, something that is um, focused on products, single products, not systems. Um, all the subsidies are there focused on, uh, on delivering a product, not a process, which is very often needed if you want to deliver a service as well. What we saw is that uh, out of those uh, businesses that are service oriented, have a business model that is service oriented and have the right skills and demonstrate the right behavior, uh, there are differing uh, ways of dealing with the system in transition. Some ignore it, um, some try to follow it uh, to some extent, but there is also a very interesting small subset of entrepreneurs out there that actually say, you know what? Um, with the system in transition, uh, that's actually an opportunity to us. And we are going to actually reconfigure the system. We are going to be transition entrepreneurs. So this is a very interesting new type of entrepreneurship out there. In the literature, it's also called institutional entrepreneurship uh, because it's about changing institutions. It's about changing regulations, laws, um, culture to some extent. And those entrepreneurs uh, that were successful at actually doing this, we found several really beautiful cases, they demonstrate an additional three set of capabilities of behavior um, that, that um, to some extent, of course, uh, only uh, really uh, clarifies why they were being successful at doing this. And the first one is that they were able to deal with the complexity um, of the system uh, in transition and uh, to some extent also uh, dealing with this technocratic block issue and the contestation by sourcing. They were able to really um, effectively tap into multiple resources, intellectual resources or knowledge, but also economic, uh, but also authoritative resources. So they knew how to actually uh, connect um, those resources that have mandate, etc., to uh, collaboratively, because that's really a strong um, work uh, that they do throughout whatever they do. They do it collaboratively. Um, and they create value, multiple value for multiple actors, including the system itself. They treat the system as an actor uh, itself. The second behavior they demonstrate is that they uh, discourse. They really create a new narrative, a new story. Um, and they do so by, again, collaboratively aligning uh, the different uh, visions, uh, issues uh, that need to be um, uh, dealt with in their interdependency. So instead of reducing complexity, trying to control it, reducing the uncertainty that all of them are facing. They actually say, in light of this uncertainty, we think that this is a vision, this is a narrative that actually can bring us all together and further. And in doing so, they actually became very powerful um, in changing uh, institutional elements. And the last skill that they demonstrate is uh, networking. They are able to use their informal position, their organizational position, and their institutional position to actually build a network, a very diverse network with deep, uh, diverse relationships, um, and orchestrating this multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral, multi-level type of collaboration, demonstrating leadership in, in view of the lack of, uh, of, of leadership that I discussed uh, before, um, and being accepted in, in, uh, in that position. So um, those actors, those entrepreneurs uh, are really important for the energy transition, uh, but they are few. Uh, and to some extent, of course, the, the behavior that they are demonstrating is uh, difficult to transfer to others. Uh, but there's a lot uh, that um, system stakeholders, su such as policymakers and um, local authorities, uh, energy agencies, can actually do to support uh, these type of entrepreneurs and those that would be able to become such entrepreneurs uh, better. And we have a whole set of recommendations uh, about it, uh, but time's up. Uh, so if you want to read more, it's a teaser, uh, go to the, the websites fit2serve.eu. It's still a little bit in, in construction, but in a week time it will be completely finished. But you can already browse 
Um, and we would really love to hear back from you uh, in, in, um, uh, in, in the coming weeks. Um, and um, well, we hope to be able to continue this work uh, in the next few years as well. Um, that's my presentation. Um, could I ask the other presenters to um, also open up their camera again and join me uh, in, um, in the final uh, panel? I see um, a lot of questions uh, already uh, on the Q&A. Um, I propose that we just take a few for, for each of the uh, presenters um, and then uh, we can open up uh, the floor uh, to have a more interactive uh, type of uh, discussion. Um, so I see a first uh, question uh, for uh, Susanna. Uh, let me see. It's from Jenny, I think. Um, how time consuming was the method for the participants, Susanna? Uh, was it difficult to get people to actually participate? Uh, yes, thank you for this question. Um, um, how time consuming the method was for the participants depend on the type of uh, training that we did. Um, this was also a question we, of course, got from the companies before they wanted to commit. How much time will this take us? So we made an estimate for how much time we thought it would cost higher management, middle management and production. Um, and um, I don't I don't know from the top of my head what 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 we what I can I can share it with you if you're interested. But um, uh, in many cases, reality uh, was different in um in some companies, we uh, did uh, multiple trainings with several uh, groups. Uh, in other companies, we did just one. In some companies, we did also do trainings with the middle man management, and in other companies, we didn't. Um, so, yeah, it varied. Um, it um, was not so difficult to get people to participate in the trainings once, once the companies had committed to the pilot program. But it was particularly difficult to motivate them to participate in the evaluation and in sometimes also the preliminary research, particularly the culture survey, was uh, sometimes we uh, struggled with low response rates um, there. Uh, that connects very much to the second question that Jenny asked about the quality to some extent of the material you got out of it. So. Um... Yes, we got very rich material on uh, drivers and barriers from the interviews uh, that we did. Um, culture survey, we were less successful because we found that in some countries these questions were considered very sensitive. And also in some cases, uh, particularly the smaller companies, it was difficult to take into account the privacy of the participants. Um, I recall that in in the in the in the pilot companies in Germany, there are quite some rules on uh, obtaining data from employees. So uh, everything had to be checked with um, the the um, the um, I don't know the English word ondernemersraad. Do you know Ruth? <laughs> no, I don't. No. And you, anyway, um, so we ran into some some uh, uh, issues with uh, with data collection, but the material from the interviews was really good. So. Um, uh, we had a very good understanding of uh, the drivers and barriers that we could take into account in the co-creation sessions and also the interviews with the energy managers were very helpful. We had a very good picture uh, of these pilot companies of um, the actual status of their energy management and the measures that they had taken. Also, for example, whether they already had an ISO certification, all that type of information we, uh, we were able to collect up front. Yeah, so it sounds like a very rich um, exploration indeed. Um, let's move to uh, Michele. Um, Michele, there's a question about how consultant companies can be involved in your uh, type of auditing uh, process. Or was this a question for you, Suzanne? I think it's for you still. From um, JC Freight. JC Freight, is, are you still there? Yes, you are. Please can you perhaps um, 
how the consulted companies can be involved in the EE auditing process? I don't quite understand the question. I think we leave it for now, uh, Susanna, because um, uh, perhaps uh, JC Freyd, if, if he's still here, can uh, uh, explain a bit more later. But let's let's move on also in, in view of time to, uh, to Michaela. Um, a question that I had for you, Michaela, is... Um, did, I mean, you, you performed a campaign. Um, I guess you had probably different types of messages also in that campaign. Um, did, do you think the different types of messages also probably led to different types of measures being um, uh, implemented more easily or not? Uh, to cure it for the question, um, uh, actually, I was more involved in the uh, monitoring of the campaign. I did not take part of the campaign, actually. But uh, <laughs> um, for sure, the, uh, the, 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 the way in which the message uh, was deliver, delivered was very important. As we've seen also from the, the results of the questionnaire that we carried out, uh, for sure, the uh, roundtables uh, on the energy audits uh, and the seminars uh, organized face-to-face uh, -face between the energy agency and the companies uh, have been a significant opportunity for, uh, for discussion and were among the most uh, um, appreciated way to deliver uh, this message. Uh, for sure, uh, is to underline that, uh, uh, as Claudia has um, underlined before, that uh, um, NEA has uh, um, a very um, high uh, level of knowledge on the um, energy efficiency intervention that can be done as we received over uh, 10,000 energy audits for, uh, for the, from the companies. Therefore, uh, probably there, is, there isn't a single message was more effective as uh, is involved in, in a great variety of uh, companies from this, uh, different sectors. But anyway, um, from the results, I can say that uh, for sure the face-to-face -face opportunity for discussion were among the most uh, uh, relevant uh, uh, moments for uh, improving the uh, company's behavior with respect to energy savings. Yeah. Jenny, you had a question for me, Michaela, as well, on uh, the definition of good uh, energy. Ah, yes, uh, yes. Now, in, in this case, uh, I just actually used this uh, word as a synonym uh, during the presentation. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, how do you define, with respect to, to the work I presented, how do you define uh, the um, the, the, me the measures suggest uh, um, actions that allows companies to reduce the amount of energy consumed, uh, uh, maintaining the same uh, production level, basically. Just, just this. Yes, you, you are, by using such a word in this, in this um, uh, environment as a synonym is uh, very dangerous. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sorry, but <laughs> so, so. it was not just to repeat almost the same word. <laughs> no problem. Um, just to increase uh, interactivity, uh, is there anyone in the audience who would like to reflect on what has just been said by Susanna and Michele? Uh, anyway, again, um, also uh, I see a question how did you get the board of the directors cooperate with this investigation? Uh, maybe this can be interesting because. Um, um, as Claudia explained, uh, uh, basically uh, in Italy, uh, uh, com large com large size companies and energy intensive companies have this uh, mandatory requirement to submit an energy audit to an um, online portal, uh, which is managed by an which is the National Energy Efficiency Agency. Therefore, including uh, all of this board of uh, uh, managers from companies was, was quite easy because uh, we have all their contacts and uh, uh, through this uh, seminar conference, uh, uh, there is a very tight uh, uh, relationship between the agency and the managers. So it was very easy and the response rate was, uh, was very high. Uh, we also performed the, the, this, uh, this analysis uh, uh, in 2020 
and we had even more responses. We have uh, over 500 responses. So oh, that's really I high. Think. Yeah. Um, I also see that Susanna answered to that question as well um, at the end of the chat. Um, very similar type of uh, reaction. Uh, so that's uh, that's clearly uh, the way to go to get a high response uh, rate. Um, anyone from the audience, don't forget to unmute yourself if you want to say something. No one, I think. All right, then we move on um, to uh, to Jenny. Um, there are several questions, uh, Jenny. Um, I had also a question about the practice approach for you. Uh, would you think uh, if uh, that the practice approach would be also interesting to use to understand the, um, the decision making uh, of the, the property owners? Yes, I think that would be a very good approach, actually. But I'm not so sure that we have the data collected for it. We have done a practice uh, uh, approach uh, analysis earlier, me and, and Katarina Reindel, uh, when we studied energy efficiency in, in uh, real estate companies. But then we had done participatory observation because then we could see how they reasoned about energy efficiency. And the problem now is that we only have the interviews and we of course have annual reports and all that but uh, I'm not really sure if we would be able because practice theory is quite complex that you need many uh, aspects to, to say something about the practice so I'm not sure but I would love that <laughs> because I think it would be wonderful to just sit in there and really try to understand why they make a decision that they made. So that would be paper number three then, probably. Yes, yes, that would be so <laughs> <Good>. nice. <laughs> and there is a question from uh, Nelson Sommerfeld uh, to you about payoff time. Uh, are there any other KPIs uh, they are looking uh, at? Um, and he mentions that they are doing a study for a Swedish warehouse now that has a solid rate of return, but still below their normal hurdle rate. And it could be framed as a marketing cost even though it's just an opportunity cost for them. Yes, and this is also a super interesting question, actually. And I was when I, when I saw it, I was thinking about yeah, um, because what, when what they are talking about, and that is my experience from earlier interviews as well, is this payoff time. That is the one cost that everyone is quite obsessed with, and the other one is how much money will they save when selling back electricity to the grid. So when we are talking with them, these are the two parameter, economic parameter that is very much in focus. But if we should start to really dig into this as Nelson and, and them have done here, then I'm not sure really, but we haven't, uh, spontaneously, we, we can't see this in our material, but if we would have asked about it perhaps, so that would be super interesting Nelson, if you could share that material with us later. Yep. Am I allowed to talk? Is it okay? Yes. <laughs> yes. Yay, um, someone from the audience. Hey, hey, we're alive. I can even, you can even see me. Um, yeah, no, this is right up what we're doing uh, in our project as well. So this afternoon, I'll talk more about this in our presentation and trying to, it's the same experience. They talk about payback time. That's what they want to talk about. It's like, well, maybe let's talk about something else and shift away. And there was a nice comment from someone else about literature about this as well, trying to redefine the value for, for that. So, um, but yeah, it's, we're seeing similar things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but great. And we will look into your presentation as well. Yeah. Super. Good. Perfect. Thank you, Nelson. Uh, and indeed, uh, Susanna already mentioned that there is a wealth of literature on multiple benefits. Uh, Katrin Kormans, I, I don't know actually if she's presenting at Behave. I don't think so, but that's really beautiful work uh, on the multiple benefits uh, in decision making at uh, organizations. Um, so let's go to uh, Claudia. Um, there's a question uh, again, from JC Freight uh, on how the energy efficiency mandatory mechanism uh, works in Italy. Are there penalties for not complying or uh, not providing enough uh, savings? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, Enea just uh, manages the database of the energy audits and collect them within this portal. 
and uh, but the uh, energy audits are carried out by certified auditors or companies and yes there are penalties uh, which are managed by the ministry the ministry of the economic development um, but only for companies that don't present the obligation the obligatory audit um, they, re, they are uh, the energy intensive companies uh, are also uh, obliged to um, develop one of the uh, interventions which have been um, identified within the energy audit. Uh, um, so yes, they are obliged, they have penalties, so there are uh, controls, so we... <laughs> Uh, yeah, and, and Patrick uh, Crean asks, um, those that you were uh, involving in your research, uh, did they do so on a voluntary uh, base? Um, um, well, mm, the main part of the SMEs are energy intensive industries, so uh, they are obliged to carry out uh, energy audits. Uh, some of them are related to some regional calls. So they have some uh, financing for uh, develop the energy audit, and a very very few part of them are voluntary. But I think I think they are very <laughs> few. Yeah, and then a final question: If you also have numbers um, of the implementation of measures by SMEs? Uh, well, we are working on this because we are also working on specific analysis about uh, small and medium sized enterprises, but we are still working so we have not um we have data on energy audits but not on savings now um okay. so we have published something but i think it was in italian so <laughs> we are working to publish even more about this okay and helen uh, williams asks um sorry if you already mentioned this but how do you define energy intensive is it solely sector-based uh, well <clears throat> there is a specific definition which is related to the uh, specific sector so there are some specific sectors we can apply which can apply to this um, uh, mechanism and it is related to the energy consumption uh, ele electric energy consumption which should be higher than one gigawatt hours per year and there is also uh, um, a relation with the ratio between uh, the consumption and the production. Okay, so there is a specific table where, but the first thing is that you should be uh, in some specific sector, manufacturing sectors mainly. Yeah, okay, great, thank you. And Helen, great that you responded that you are indeed watching the screen <laughs> in response to the whole uh, discussion on uh, whether or not we can monitor, uh, which we can't, uh, whether or not you're uh, actually uh, actively participating. So thank you. Um, and then some questions um, uh, after my presentation. Susanna, you ask how do businesses come to adopting either a service-oriented or product-oriented business models and which factors explain this difference in choice? Um, good question. Um, it's it's um, a variety. In the end, we identified four archetypes or typologies of uh, business models um, uh, and, and entrepreneurship and how they decide for that business model. Um, what we saw is that uh, there is a type of business model that is really product oriented and the entrepreneurs, uh, they maintain um, that product orientation, even though they are hitting the ceiling in terms of market share. Um, in response to that, they don't really turn towards servitization, but they push harder. We call them the push harder uh, typology. Um, but there is also a different type of um, entrepreneurship out there uh, that actually, uh, when hitting the ceiling or facing other difficulties, um, they reframe uh, first uh, what they offer. Uh, you see that a lot of the, the um, um, those delivering measures uh, that started talking about uh, providing multiple benefits is such a um, entrepreneurship business model, um, but it's it's first more reframing and also mentioning the, the other multiple benefits. 
uh, but some of them actually uh, really um, turn their business model and then the whole organization around because to be able to deliver a service and uh, the servitization skills that I mentioned before are really important and they need to be institutionalized in the organization as well. Um, and um, uh, that's, that's a lengthy process of a few years to actually do so. And there are also uh, business models out there and the more uh, radical types that we investigated in the past years are those that um, do not start from a product or technology, but from an issue that they witness in the system, um, a pain point, a problem, uh, and then design a service around it. Um, and those are really uh, a different type of, uh, of business model. Uh, and there is a question from Jenny, and it relates to it, uh, how easy it is to combine uh, the two business models where I think I partly answered. Um, you, all of them are, uh, except for the very strongly push harder types, are a combination because, of course, um, uh, there are product service combinations. Even a service needs some kind of a product to actually support the service. Uh, so it's about uh, where the focus is in the business model and not so much whether it's providing merely a product or a service. Um, so uh, the most successful ones are the ones that have a service that is enabled by products instead of products that are enabled by services. I'm going a bit quick now, but um, for those of you with a bit more knowledge, I think you, um, you get it um, about this, uh, because the whole servitization approach actually we found is something that is not really looked into very much yet in the energy sector. So I really invite uh, all of you to... to uh, to delve into it because it's a beautiful uh, field of research. Um, and uh, JC Freyd asked, uh, who is the owner, uh, the, uh, who has the final property of the equipment? Um, well, that, that depends. Very often you see that uh, there is a, um, uh, a lease construct or uh, where the product remains the property of uh, the business uh, developer. Um, and the users, uh, they, they take what the product offers, the service it offers. Uh, so, uh, but there's a lot of um, in between uh, as well. I think that concludes it for today, uh, for this session. I mean, not for, for Behave, of course. Uh, it was very nice hearing all of you, listening to you, uh, learned a lot. Uh, I hope the audience um, was happy with the with the session, and I look forward to see a lot of you uh, during coffee breaks and in uh, in other sessions. Uh, and thank you uh, for uh, for participating. <laughs>